Really? Yeah. Baseball is not a very international sport, actually. So. Okay. Uh, so I would never claim to be able to fill Christos' shoes in, in anything more than the most literal sense. Uh, I don't think he wears bigger than a size 15. Um, and, uh, but so, so I'll do my best. Uh, first order of business, I think, uh, is to one more time, uh, as the last speaker, I want to lead everybody in thanking the organizers, Noam, Michal, Tali, uh, Ofer in the back, and everyone else who put this on. So thanks very much. I think it's been a really sort of amazing showcase about the vibrancy of algorithmic game theory roughly 12 years in. Uh, and certainly I, for one, you know, feel privileged to be, to be a part of it. So what I want to talk about today uh, is a couple facets of um, a research agenda I'm involved in, where the goal is to, in some sense, have the best of both worlds in auction design. I want to study auctions which are simple, really simple. Okay, so so simple that you could really imagine perhaps using them or some variant in the real world. Perhaps even some variant of them is already in use and easy, easy to see. Okay, and nonetheless, despite the simplicity, there should be some rigorous sense in which you can prove worst case bounds on their performance relative to perhaps very complicated auctions. Okay. Believe it or not, I wrote this slide before the panel discussion on Tuesday, uh, but it's, it's quite relevant. So, you know, why do we do what we do, say, in optimal auction design? What's the point of the research? Well, there's a lot of points. There's a lot of totally legitimate points, and it's really healthy that there's different people uh, with different motivations for working in optimal auction design. Uh, one of the points, the one I'm going to focus on today, is in going through the exercise of positing a model of auctions and solving for the optimal with respect to some objective, you might hope to examine that optimal solution and from it, from its structural features, identify uh, aspects of auction formats which you'd hope would work well in practice. And exhibit A of this kind of philosophy would be the lovely but lonely victory auction, uh, just a single item second price auction. Say you wanted to maximize welfare ex post. Just use the victory auction, okay? No matter what the valuation profile is, uh, it's going to be given to the highest bidder, dominant strategy, incentive compatible. Say you wanted to maximize revenue, say expected revenue, say you had a common prior and IIV bidders, again, just use the victory auction, now supplemented with a reserve price, which is dependent on the distribution. And despite the fact that the space of all incentive compatible auctions is unthinkably rich, the optimal solution is attained just at this simple uh, victory auction, possibly with a reserve. Now, you make the setting a little bit more complicated along any number of axes, and things get a little uh, harder to interpret. It's no longer unclear what to infer from optimal auctions. So let's suppose you stayed with revenue maximization. You stayed even with a single item auction. Bidders even say are still independent, but are no longer identical, can have different valuation distributions. Uh, of course, Meyerson's theory tells us the optimal auction. You just transform bids into virtual bids, award the good to the highest virtual bidder, and charge the unique payments that would give you incentive compatibility. So it's easy enough to state for those of you educated in virtual valuations. But still, not, you know, if you really tried to explain this to someone who had never heard of a virtual valuation, it would be a little hard to interpret. And perhaps that's one of the reasons, even this simple auction, it's not clear how often you see this uh, really in use. In particular, the highest bidder need not be the winner, because virtual bids need not be ordered the same as bids. And the price charged to the winner, again, hard to interpret. Uh, for example, it could be higher or lower than the second highest bid. Okay. If you cared about welfare, so now we could think about sort of more complicated allocation problems beyond single item goods. For example, combinatorial auctions with M heterogeneous goods partitioned among N players. Of course, we still have a dominant strategy, incentive compatible uh, mechanism that maximizes welfare, the VCG mechanism. Uh, I don't need to tell this audience the long list of sort of deal breakers that prevents the VCG mechanism from really being implementable. Uh, in real settings. Even in particular, direct revelation, asking people for their private preferences on all two to the m possible bundles they might get, where m is the number of goods, uh, is really kind of an absurd uh, thought experiment once m is, is even modestly large. Okay? Um, good. So there has, have, of course, been a lot of nice work about approximate uh, truthful welfare maximizing mechanisms, in particular by this community. Uh, and I I think that's something we should be really proud of. I think we've done a great job of understanding what's possible in principle, which is certainly one of the main points of this theory. You know, I think one could argue that that theory is not yet mature enough uh, to say influence how combinatorial auctions are being done in practice. I think it could be done, but I think uh, it's not quite there yet. 
All right, so a different approach from thinking about arbitrarily complex auctions, looking for the optimal one, and hoping that it tells you something uh, about what you might want to actually do to solve the problem, a different approach would be to restrict the set of auctions in some way. Okay, so you identify a set of, in some sense, simple auctions, plausibly implementable auctions, whatever you want to call it. And I want to warn you now, I think we need formal definitions of these fuzzy English words, but I'm not going to give them to you. The research agenda is not there yet. But in any case, you might want to optimize over a restricted subset of auctions and find the best one. Now, as a sanity check to make sure you haven't thrown out the baby with the bathwater, it better be the case that when you optimize over this restricted set, you haven't thrown out all of the good auctions. That the optimal over this restricted set is ideally, provably, in the worst case, performance close to that of the optimal auction had you solved over arbitrarily complex things. So what I want to talk about today is a couple of relatively recent works of mine that uh, are examples of this philosophy. And certainly there are others that have been done by other people. We've heard a number even this week. So I want to touch on two results uh, in the spirit of being the, the final speaker on the final day. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I'll give you some proof hints here and there, but mostly it's going to have more of a survey flavor, just explain a few results. First, I want to chat about a, a relatively older paper that Jason Hartline and I did in EC09 a couple years ago. This is no longer the state of the art. There's been a number of follow-ups, but despite that, I'm going to talk about it anyways, because I think it's a good example. So this is going to be about expected revenue maximization. It's only going to be about single parameter environments, though fairly general ones. And because it's single parameter, Meyerson's theory applies, tells us what the optimal auction is. But the motivating question will be, is there a much simpler auction that does almost as well? And we'll give you affirmative answers saying, yes, really all you need to do is welfare maximization supplemented with simple reserve prices. And we'll have provable performance guarantees for that mechanism. The second part will be more recent work uh, with Chipra Bawalkar, uh, which is in Soda 11. Chipra is right there. Probably many of you know her. Uh, this, in fact, also has a follow-up paper. That's what Noam talked about on Tuesday. Uh, that's an EC11 paper. So, but in, in our work, what we do is we think about a combinatorial auction. Again, I said for a modest number of goods, direct revelation just is, is out of the question. You cannot really ask people for two to the m private parameters once m is large. So we're going to compress the message space, give bidders a, a very limited vocabulary to express their preferences. We call it item bidding. Bidders will only submit one bid per each good. Each good is then allocated in an independent uh, Vickery auction. Okay, so what you heard about in Noam's talk on Tuesday was, again, independent uh, item auctions, but using first price auctions. We're going to be talking about second price auctions, and we're going to be looking at welfare uh, guarantees at equilibria of that very simple mechanism. Okay. All right, so let me jump into the uh, first uh, set of results with Jason Hartline from a couple years ago. Um, so these are about single parameter problems. Strictly speaking, it's about downward closed environments. Some of you know what they are. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just think about the following example, uh, which nicely illustrates sort of a, you know, shows that even single parameter problems can be pretty interesting and complicated to think about. So let's think about commentary auctions. So again, M heterogeneous goods, N players. To make it a single parameter version, I'm going to talk about single minded bidders. Okay, so for, for example, bidder number one only wants goods one, three, and five, and is totally fixated on them. If it doesn't get all three of those goods, it has no value, and it doesn't care about getting extra goods beyond that. Bidder number two maybe wants goods 3, 7, and 10. Bidder three wants goods 17 and 22, and so on. Moreover, these are known. Okay? You know what subset of bids a bidder wants. What you don't know is its private valuation, how much it's willing to pay to acquire that bundle. So that is the single private parameter uh, of each bundle. Okay? So uh, the feasible subsets are just, you can select a subset of uh, the bidders whose bundles are pairwise disjoint, because each good can only be sold once. So again, it's a single parameter problem. Meyerson's theory applies perfectly well. It would just say transform the bids into virtual bids, find the allocation that maximizes the virtual welfare, charge the unique prices that would make it incentive compatible. But again, if Meyerson's optimal auction is hard to interpret for a single item auction, certainly much more so for common trail auctions with single-minded bidders. So is there something simpler in some undefined sense that's almost as good? So Jason and I gave a number of results, uh, positive results, affirmative results. I'm just going to show you one uh, in the interest of time, which I particularly like. And so this one, the simple mechanism, is going to be VCG, the VCG mechanism, supplemented with suitable bidder reserves. And the reserves are simple. They're just the monopoly reserve bidders. And I'll explain that precisely on the next slide. But if you do that, if you just filter bidders according to their monopoly reserve prices and then do welfare maximization on top, you are guaranteed to get within a factor two of the expected revenue of Meyerson's optimal mechanism. Okay? What are my assumptions on distributions? Well, they're independent. Okay? They do not have to be identical. You can have different 
uh, valuation distributions for different bidders that will result in different uh, monopoly reserve prices for different bidders. And I am assuming, I will assume that they satisfy the monotone hazard rate condition. So informally, their tails can be as heavy as an exponential distribution, but no heavier than that. Okay, and I'll show you why that's useful in the proof uh, in a couple slides. All right, so any questions at this point other than exactly what do I mean by the mechanism, which is what the next slide is, or why is it true, which is in two slides? Anything else? Uh, I don't know. This is a two-look-ahead talk from my perspective. Okay, everything clear so far? All right. So what do I really mean by Vickery, uh, VCG supplemented with monopoly reserves? Well, first, what's a monopoly reserve? So we saw this in Anna's talk. So basically, go to bidder number one, say. And as a thought experiment, suppose bidder one was the only bidder in the world, and you were just trying to sell it one good, and that bidder's valuation was drawn from its distribution F1. Ask yourself the question, if I had to slap a price tag on this good and make a take it or leave it offer to this bidder, what would be the optimal price tag? So all you do is you choose P, the price, to maximize the revenue from the sale, P times the probability of the sale, which is 1 minus the CDF uh, at that price, P. Okay, so it's a simple one-dimensional optimization problem. The maximizer is the reserve price for bidder I. Okay, so if they have same distribution, it's the same reserve prices, different distributions, in, di in general, different reserve prices. So the mechanism is, first, delete anybody, so collect bids from the bidders, delete anybody that doesn't clear their reserve, and then just simply do welfare maximization with who's left. Just run the VCG mechanism. You charge the unique prices that make it incentive compatible, which is simply the maximum of the reserve prices and the VCG prices. Okay? That's the mechanism. Why is it true? Why is it too approximate? Well, I'm not going to really prove this to you. So I'm going to have one slide, one, one quote-unquote technical slide, which is this one. Uh, for this slide, I'm going to assume that you know what, for example, virtual valuations are. Okay, many of you do. Uh, and if you do and you're still awake, I hope you get something out of what I'm about to say. If you don't, you know, go ahead and think about the Tel Aviv beach for, uh, for the next couple minutes. Okay, but I promise it's, ju it's just this slide before uh, we're going to reset. Okay? So for the lemma, we're going to just say something very simple. And then I'll explain why this uh, applies, uh, should imply our theorem. So think now just about, say, a single bidder. It has a valuation distribution, capital F. Oh, so it's a simple lemma, but why am I telling you? Because even this simple lemma tells you sort of the two pieces of information you should be wondering about in the theorem. First of all, what is the role of the MHR assumption in the distributions? This will show up in this proof. Secondly, where does the two come from? Okay, so both of those will be evident from this lemma and its proof. So we have an MHR distribution, capital F. It has some monopoly price R. I just explained that what that was. Uh, recall that another way to think about the monopoly reserve of a distribution is exactly uh, the bid or the valuation that has zero virtual valuation. So the claim is that if you look at any valuation V that clears the reserve price R, <clears throat> if I take the sum of the reserve and the virtual value, then that's at least the value. Okay? Forget for the moment why this might be useful. Let's just, it's a simple calculation that justifies it. Let's do the calculation and then explain why, how to apply it. So, okay, we start with uh, the reserve and the virtual value. Recall that the virtual value, by definition, is just the value minus 1 over the hazard rate of the distribution. Now, by the monotone hazard rate condition, if I replace, and remember, V is at least R, by hypothesis. So if I, if I look at the hazard rate instead at R, that's a smaller hazard rate. So 1 over the hazard rate is bigger. I'm subtracting a bigger thing, so I get a smaller number. So that's that inequality. And again, remember, the monopoly reserve price is characterized by having virtual value 0. So those terms drop out. Okay? Simple calculation shows, for whatever reason, reserve price plus virtual value of something above the reserve is at least the value. Here's what we can now easily derive. Okay? So forget about opt for a moment, and let's just think about our mechanism, VCG mechanism with reserves. I claim that double <clears throat> the revenue that we earn by our mechanism is at least the welfare of our mechanism. Okay? That is, our revenue is at least, we extract as revenue, half of our own welfare. Why is that? Well, remember, double, on the left-hand side of this inequality is double our own revenue. So what revenue do we get when somebody is awarded, if somebody wins in our auction? Well, we certainly get at least the reserve price from this bidder. Okay, everyone has to pay the reserve. Further, recall Meyerson's identity saying that the expected revenue of a mechanism is equal to the expected virtual surplus, so the expected virtual valuations of the winner. So for the other copy of the revenue, we're going to say, oh, well, we can uh, equate that to the virtual value of this person who won. And remember, anyone who wins does indeed have a value above the reserve. Okay, so this is one copy. So this corresponds to one copy of our mechanism's revenue, a lower bound. 
This corresponds to a second copy of our mechanism's revenue, and this corresponds to the welfare earned by our revenue. Okay? So there's a sum over bidders and an averaging over all the valuation profiles in here, but this is where the two comes from. Double our revenue is at least our welfare. Okay? So what about the optimum? That's what we care about. Well, what does Meyerson's mechanism do? Well, certainly it never allocates to anybody with a negative virtual value. Remember, it optimizes, it takes the maximum possible virtual value. So in particular, it effectively deletes all bidders that have negative virtual value, that is, bidders that don't clear their reserve. So the optimal mechanism, what is it doing? Deletes bidders who don't clear the reserve, and then something else. What do we do? Delete bidders that don't clear the reserve, and then maximize welfare. Therefore, our welfare is certainly at least as large as the welfare of the optimal mechanism. Okay? So double our revenue is at least our welfare, is at least the welfare of the optimal mechanism, which is certainly at least the revenue of the optimal mechanism. There's your factor two. Okay. Questions before the second part of the talk? Okay. So let me talk about this more recent work uh, that now studies welfare maximization, approximate welfare maximization, um, when you have very small message spaces, when you give bidders a very small uh, vocabulary for expressing their preferences. Kevin. So Kevin asked if the question is tight, uh, and the answer is, in fact, for arbitrary MHR distributions, uh, it is tight. So I don't need to make a conjecture. I can just tell you the answer. So for exponential distributions, in fact, you can lose as much as 50%. If you're willing to make more stringent restrictions on the tails, you could, be able, you could derive bounds better than 50%. So that would be an interesting exercise, which is certainly doable, but, but I'll be honest, we haven't done that in the paper, would be to further parameterize the distributions to get an approximation ratio closer to 2. Other questions before I move on? All right. So you've seen comparable auctions over and over again at this point. Uh, I'm pretty much going to skip this slide. Everything is standard. M heterogeneous goods, N players. Everybody, every player has a private valuation for each subset S of goods they might get. Again, recall two to the M private parameters in general per, uh, per good. And we're interested in welfare maximization. So how do you allocate the goods, partition the goods so that we maximize the welfare, okay? Of course, you could use the VCG mechanism, but among its other uh, really uh, sort of no starter properties is the fact that direct revelation would require two to the M parameters from each bidder. We're gonna ask for only M. The way we're gonna do that is we're going to ask each bidder to independently place a bid on each of the M items for sale, which will subsequently be allocated using a Vickery auction, okay? So if you're a bidder and you place out bids, the goods on which you're the highest bidder are exactly the ones that you're allocated, and the price you pay is exactly the second highest bids uh, on all of those goods. Okay, the sum of the second highest bids over the goods that you win. Okay, so that is what we call item bidding. Arguably, you know, to some to some degree, this this uh, this auction is effectively in use. If you're trying to buy a bunch of things at once uh, on eBay, you are sort of forced into using basically a bunch of parallel victory auctions to acquire the bundles that you need. All right, so. Let me show you an example to get you a feel for it. Oh, again, so just, so just to say something totally obvious. So we're definitely not talking about truthful or dominant strategy mechanisms at this point, right? I mean, I just haven't given you the space to tell me what you want, to, spell, to tell me your preferences. So we're going to be looking at equilibria and welfare loss at equilibria in the game induced by item bidding. Okay, so that's what these theorems are going to be about. So let me show you an example uh, just to sort of warm up. So let's just say two bidders, two goods. Both bidders are unit demand. The first bidder, it would really like to have the second good, good B. It would pay two for that. It would only pay one for good A. Okay? Bidder number two, also unit demand, is the opposite. It would pay two for good A, but you know, we're going to be, be willing to pay one for good B. So the optimal solution is obvious. You give B to number one, A to number two. That would give you a welfare of four. Uh, that can also arise as a, let's say, for the moment, you know, for the sake of simplicity, let's look at the full information version of the game and, and pure Nash equilibria. We'll talk about other things shortly. So certainly this optimal solution would also arise as a full information Nash equilibrium, but there will be others as well. Okay? So in particular, I claim that if we look at the following set of bids, this would also be a pure Nash equilibrium in the full information game. The first bidder bids one on the first good and zero on the second, and for the second bidder, it reverses. Okay? It bids uh, zero on the first good and one on the second. So I claim, so certainly this has welfare too, because people get the wrong goods, and I claim it's an Ash equilibrium. And maybe I'll just let you stare at it for a few seconds to see if you believe me. 
The upshot is, is that a bidder gets the good it likes less, but it gets it for free. Trying to get the uh, good that it values more, it would have to pay one. Remember, we're using a second price option on each good. Okay. All right. So any questions about item bidding or the game that it naturally induces? Yep, Vince. That's true. Um, so um, I believe you can make, so I don't think I picked the best example. I believe you can make it more robust and have examples with welfare loss close to factor two, but I'm not positive. But, uh, but uh, the, this, put it this way, the, the welfare loss is not as brittle as this example might make it appear. Okay. So in fact, I mean, this is really a kind of form of, of a bluffing equilibrium I'm going to rule out in a second anyways. Okay. But, but welfare loss at equilibrium is a fundamental aspect of this model. But uh, because of the simplicity of the example, it might give you the wrong idea. Other questions about the example or item bidding? Okay. All right. So um, to measure welfare loss at equilibrium, I'm going to use the very much alive and kicking price of anarchy, which of course is the measure to look at how much objective function loss you have at the equilibria of a game. So in this case, we're going to be looking at the ratio between the hypothetical maximum welfare you could ever achieve, or put differently, the numerator is what you could get if you had the extravagant resources required to run the VCG mechanism. Okay, so the top is the best possible welfare, like in the last example that was four. On the, on the denominator, is we're, the, we're looking at the welfare at equilibrium. Okay, and we're going to have to discuss over, we're going to look at the worst case over some set of equilibria. We'll have to discuss what is that set of equilibria, and we'll discuss a number of different sets. Okay, so pure Bayes Nash, and et cetera. Okay. And of course, we'd like, to, we'd like to understand when is the case that this ratio is close to one, and then at least if your game reaches an equilibrium, you're not losing much relative to, say, a perfect VCG uh, implementation. Okay. And I should say, you know, one trend which, you know, I think is very cool, which has been, you know, happening just for maybe the last sort of three years or so, is the adoption of, of these uh, price of energy measures to understand non-truthful mechanisms. I think that's been a great trend in AGT. Uh, in the last few years. And certainly, I'm by, by no means the only one do it, doing it. A number of other people have nice papers on that topic uh, from the last several years. Okay, to get any uh, interesting results, non-trivial results, it is provably necessary to make the following two assumptions. So let me explain the assumptions, then I'll tell you what the results are. The first assumption is about the structure of the valuations of the bidders, okay? So we're not, going to, we're not going to analyze bidders with arbitrary valuations. We would not be able to prove anything interesting. The reason is that with arbitrary valuations, it's NP hard to prove any kind of approximation, uh, to achieve any kind of approximation of the optimal welfare. And we cannot expect our equilibria to solve NP hard problems for us. So a minimal condition to having interesting results here is that it is not NP hard to get a decent approximation of the optimal welfare. Basically, the biggest class of valuations we know with that property is subadditive or also called complement-free valuations. Okay, so you've seen this already this week a couple times. To remind you, the valuation that a <coughs> bidder has for the union of two bundles should be no more than its value for each of the sets summed up. Okay? So that's the first assumption. All the theorems will be only about <coughs> complement-free bidders. The second thing, and this is sort of related to that bad example, but a much more severe version of it, is that even if you have merely one good, and nearly two bidders, and you're looking at the welfare maximizing victory auction, it actually has a full information Nash equilibrium with zero welfare, okay, or with negligible, with arbitrarily poor welfare. If the valuations are one and zero, but the bidders bid zero and one, you think about it a second, this is actually a pure strategy Nash equilibrium with zero welfare. So we, have, we can't talk about all equilibria, just about ones uh, <coughs> that don't have this kind of bluffing problem, okay? So the way we're going to do that is we're going to Prove theorems about equilibria in which there is no overbidding, or at least approximately no overbidding. By which I mean, we're going to look at equilibria where if we look at any bundle of goods S and any player I, and we look at the sum of the bids, Bij, that the player has offered for the goods in S, for the talk, let's just assume that the sum of the bids is no more than its valuation Vi for that bundle of goods S. Okay? So in general, our results degrade gracefully. If you say nobody overbids by more than some factor, that factor is just going to appear in our bound. Okay, but for simplicity, let's just say that we look at equilibria in which nobody overbids on any set. Okay? Obviously, if you do that, you're at risk of getting negative utility. Okay? So those are the two assumptions. Here's what we can prove under those two assumptions. So again, what are we proving? We're proving about an arbitrary combinatorial auction with item bidding 
and subadded evaluations, and they're about arbitrary equilibria in which there is no overbidding. Okay, so that is what these bounds apply to. So we're going to do both. Okay. Correct. Okay, so there's going to be so the two bullet points are exactly about the two different cases on this slide. So uh, it's not clear to me that the full information case is particularly well motivated in this context. So I don't want to oversell this, but for completeness, let me just say uh, we did as a warm up think about the full information case and in, in Nash equilibria. And it turns out that pure Nash equilibria, they don't always exist. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. When they do exist, you actually get 50% of the welfare back for any subadded evaluations at any pure Nash equilibrium without overbidding. Okay, so you can contrast this with the follow-up work that Noam talked about on Tuesday, which again used first price auctions instead of second price auctions. Again, they did not always have equilibria. When they had them, they actually had full efficiency. Here we do not, and in fact, I've already shown you an example in which this is tight. So the example I showed you earlier was subadded evaluations. Uh, there was no overbidding, and we were off by a factor of two. Okay. Perhaps more interesting is the incomplete information case. So we're looking at Bayes-Nash equilibria. So in this setup, each player has a, a distribution over subadded evaluations. Uh, we do assume that the bidders have independent valuations. We do not assume that they have identical distributions. That doesn't matter. And what we prove is that in any Bayes-Nash equilibrium with independence of added evaluations, we get a welfare loss bounded above by two times log, natural log of M, where remember M is the number of goods. Okay? This is a bigger number. We have proved that the factor of two is no longer valid. We have a lower bound that's a little bit bigger than two. So the first result doesn't extend. That said, let me tell you right now, for all we know, the right answer here is constant. And I think it's a great open question. Okay, there's a gap between a small constant and this 2 log m. Uh, Chipper and I wish we knew the answer. We've thought about it. We just don't know. We don't even really have a conjecture. Okay, but constant might well be possible. Now, because of the way we prove this upper bound of 2 log m via a so-called smoothness argument, it actually has lots of implications for the full information version of the game, if you're interested in that. So this bound of 2 log m also carries over to mixed Nash equilibria, correlated equilibria, and even uh, no regret sequences uh, for the full information of the game. Yeah. Uh, the is not the That's right. So um, the, I am saying that. Let me elaborate on that in, a, in about a slide. But yeah, you're, you're a little ahead of me. So, but yep, that, that's an implication of what I just said. Absolutely. Uh, I want to point out that, uh, or I want to mention that the uh, assumption of independence of the valuations is key. We can also prove that if you have correlated uh, valuation distributions, uh, even if they're submodular, then we have a polynomial lower bound on the price of anarchy. So it makes a big difference for welfare efficiency loss at equilibrium, whether uh, bidders have independent or correlated valuations. Okay. So how am I doing on time? Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, let me, so let me basically elaborate on, uh, on Ava's very prescient comment uh, a minute ago. So I'm, I'm running low on time, so I'm, I'm going to say very little. Actually, let me back up. Any questions about the results? I want to make sure everyone had enough time to stare at the theorems and ask any questions they want to about the theorems. Make sense? Okay. So, as far as how do you prove it, uh, I won't be able to tell you much. Let me just explain uh, one thing. So, okay, so in general, forget about auctions or not, so in general, if you want to prove a bound on, on the price of anarchy, how do you do it? Fundamentally, what are you doing? You're saying the distinguished type of outcome, namely an equilibrium, is almost as good as an optimal solution. So you better use the fact that this is an equilibrium, okay, in your proof. So what is an equilibrium? Everybody's best responding, so that's your hypothesis. So the most sort of primitive, easiest way you could use this hypothesis of there being a Nash equilibrium is to once, for each player, use the fact that it's doing a best response. Actually, even weaker than that, for each player, dream up some hypothetical deviation that it could do and say that its payoff right now is at least as good as if it did this, executed this hypothetical deviation. Okay, so that's a very primitive application of just using the fact that you had an equilibrium. For each player, you dream up some hypothetical other strategy. Its payoff right now is at least that for this hypothetical deviation. And you do it once for each player, giving you a series of n inequalities. There's two slightly different uh, versions of this argument. One in which you dream up this hypothetical deviation, in some sense, in a very oblivious way, okay, without even looking at what the other bidders are doing. 
That's something I call a smoothness argument. And I proved a couple of years ago that if you can prove a price of anarchy bound using that very crude argument, you get lots of stuff for free. So for our bound of two on pure equilibria, it's not a smoothness argument. And the reason is, is because we have to be a little bit clever about how we dream up these hypothetical deviations, again, just one per player. So we actually look at the bids at equilibrium by the other n minus one players when we determine what is this hypothetical deviation that we're going to apply the condition to. So that takes it outside the regime of smoothness. And that's why our bound of two for pure equilibria doesn't automatically extend to all these other equilibrium concepts. On the other hand, and this is exactly what Ava was pointing out, we showed that a two cannot extend to these other equilibrium concepts. It's simply false. Therefore, the only way to prove this tight bound of two on pure equilibria is to use a proof which is not a smoothness proof. So you really do provably have to somehow come up with these hypotheses in a way which is uh, dependent on the rest of the bidder's bids. Now for the two log m, we get a worse bound, we get a worse factor. But on the other hand, it is this more primitive type of argument where when we think about the hypothetical deviation, it's independent of everything. Okay, we don't look at the other equilibrium bids. That puts it in the realm of the smoothness paradigm. And then automatically, even though the argument seems to be only for pure equilibria, the two log m automatically applies to Bayes Nash equilibria with independent valuations and also to mixed correlated and no regret sequences for the full information version of the game. Again, I want to emphasize being a smoothness proof is not sufficient to have this carry all the way out to correlated distributions in Bayes' Nash equilibria, and we have explicit constructions in this paper uh, of why not. Okay? So specifically, you can prove it in two different ways. For correlated distributions in Bayes' Nash equilibria, we have a direct construction based on random plant planted matchings. So this is even with unit demand bidders, which says the price of anarchy can be polynomial on M. Intriguingly, and this is ongoing work that I've been doing with Noam while I've been uh, visiting Hebrew University, it turns out that you can prove that if, so positively, if there were good bounds on the price of anarchy, for correlated valuation distributions in Bayes-Nash equilibria, it would imply that there were small, succinct sketches or summaries or compressed versions, if you like, of arbitrary subadditive valuation distributions. And it follows, for example, from the work that Nina talked about in her work with Nick Harvey, that such sketches do not exist. Ergo, you have to have a large polynomial uh, lower bound for the price of energy with correlated valuation. There's certainly some open questions. I already highlighted kind of the one which is really staring us in the face. So for this item bidding with sub-additive valuations, is the price of anarchy for Bayes-Nash equilibria and all these other concepts, is it constant? Or is it more in the log range or somewhere in between? I have no idea. Returning to the philosophy that I was espousing at the beginning about how we'd really like to have the theory informed what kind of auction formats might perform well in, well in practice, it would be really great to have some kind of direct comparison between the results in this paper in the follow-up paper that Noam talked about, is there some reason to prefer second price auctions when you're doing independent auctions? Or is there some reason to prefer first price auctions? An answer to that question could be really meaningful, could be really helpful. Ultimately, you know, in this talk, I said I wanted simple solutions. I meant two different things in the two different examples. In the first case, I meant I only gave a limited number of knobs to the designer. I didn't let it optimize over all the mechanisms of the world. All I gave it is knobs to tune the reserve prices. In the second part, what I meant is I compressed the message space. I gave bidders only a limited vocabulary to express their preferences. I think we need one or more uh, well-defined notions of simplicity, perhaps a notion of dimension of mechanisms. And it'd be nice to explore the entire trade-off curve for a given me mechanism complexity, exactly what is the essential, say, welfare loss at equilibrium. I think we're a couple years off from that, but uh, I hope these results are a good start. Thanks very much. We can pay.